challenges of pastoral ministry today. Challenges of pastoral ministry today. If you read, I need to start with some portions of the scripture. Because everything we do, we want it to have basis in the word of God. I want to start with that scripture, Ephesians chapter 4. Now in that passage, that very popular passage, we discover that God has given leadership gifts to the church. Namely, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And if the church is going to be what Christ intended the church to be, then we must welcome these gifts back to the church. Today, there is a lot of schism in the body. There are denominations, there are church set up that welcome prophets, pastors, but when it comes to evangelists or apostles or teachers, they have nothing to do with them. And vice versa, you see a lot of preferences here and there. But the truth of the matter is, the Lord gave these gifts to the church for the perfecting of the saints, for the equipping of the body of Christ. All of them must function pari pasu. Now, the prophet sees the Macedonia where we need to go for soul winning. He informed the apostles and the apostles gather the evangelists so that they can go and do the evangelism. And the souls that are won, they hand it over to the pastor for nurture. And the teacher is to assist the pastor to nurture the saints. That's how the gifts work. And I can show you, all of them are the same. I mean, all of them, there's no one that is above the other. It is part of our carnality, part of our human culture like that we create in church, that we say, apostle is higher, uh, prophet is the best, evangelist is nobody, T pastor is everything, teacher is person on grand tata. That is our belief, that is our administration, and it's a sign of our carnality. But in the scripture, all of them must function together. And it is not until we bear that name that we are doing the work. For the sake of your understanding, to be an apostle today is to have, to have a ministry to leaders of leaders. To be an apostle today is to be somebody that has raised up many, many leaders and planted many, many churches. It takes years before you can get to apostolic ministry. You must have been a good teacher, a good evangelist, you have done the work of a pastor, and you have a measure of prophetic gift before you can say you are an apostle. In fact, it takes you nothing less than 20 years to be an apostle. Of course, a lot of people will query that because there are a lot of self-appointed apostles today. I've seen young people who are still in Bible school and they are apostles. I remember I saw one in a Bible school. Uh, I was a guest speaker or I was a visiting lecturer in that Bible school and they normally call him apostle, apostle. One young small thing. So one day I got into talking with him. I said, come here. How did you become an apostle? He said, everybody calls me that. I even dream that I am an apostle. So I accepted. But to be very candid with you, an apostle must be somebody that has a, a sent ministry, a great commission ministry, and through your ministry over the years, you have been able to raise so many leaders of leaders, planted many churches, and you are pioneer. You are pioneer in an area that others have not gone before. A prophet is a foreteller and foreteller. He foresee and foretell. Foretell and foretell. Foretell is to see a seer. In Old Testament language, it's a seer. Somebody that sees things. Somebody that has revelation. Somebody that has insight. Somebody that God communicates with. Either in pictorial language, in slibus, in poetry, or in words. That's a prophet. Also, he's a foreteller. He's also a preacher. He preaches. 
And under the New Testament, all of us are prophets. But there are some that God give that grace in an unusual measure. You know the unfortunate thing? There are a lot of prophets of New Testament that are practicing like Old Testament. A New Testament prophet is only, and not my words, only to confirm what God has told you. Not to issue a direction to your life. Hello? Well, there are a lot of issues. There are a lot of issues we need to deal with. That we need to correct in the church. You know it's wrong for a New Testament prophet to rent an office or have a place and sit down consulting. I don't know. Consulting. So people line up. Yes, sir, what do you say? Mm, don't marry that yellow sister. Marry the red one. Don't say the Lord. Amen. Next. That's an Old Testament prophet. That's not New Testament. In New Testament, all of us have the Holy Spirit. At least if you are born again, the Spirit of our Father is inside us. And what a prophet should do is that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, a truth shall be confirmed. It's only to confirm. And in New Testament ministry, you don't look for prophets. Unfortunately, there are a lot of us we build our life, build our ministry on prophets and prophecy. I know prophets will not like me for this because I am spoiling market for them. May the Lord forgive you and save my soul. But that's what we have today. And teacher, oh wow. Teaching ministry is neglected today. Evangelist ministry, uh, nobody is there. Nobody is there. Like what Reverend Edo is saying. How many people can say that in cities? No. Everything. I thank God. Somebody brought five billion yesterday. I just stole him money. Oil money. Government money. We don't care. He brought five million. And man, our God is God. Somebody was preaching and he said, the house that God has just built for him, not me, me, the house that God has just built for him, you will need a map to navigate. If you are not going to get lost. And where our souls are perishing. Hello? Let me leave there. I'm coming to the pastoral ministry. Because that is the most prominent ministry today. And when, when the evangelists, the apostles, the pastors, I mean the prophets and teachers, they hand over the soul to the pastor. The pastor... Is the one to sit with the people. You know, the, the, the downside of it today is that we have so many people in pastoral ministry who are not gifted, called, ordained, and capacitated to be there. And so many of us have found ourselves in pastoral ministry. A very, very tough ministry. Very tough ministry. You know, an apostle can be a general. He goes from here to here. Go from here to here. A teacher can be somebody like me. Yes, this is the office of a teacher. Teaching things, teaching things, teaching the scripture, teaching the truth hey, about church and all those things. And you know, for example, my contract with you is from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. After 3 p.m., your money has expired. Go to your house. If anything happens to you in the evening, what concerns me? Because it's a teaching ministry. You only came, you learn, and you're on your way. But as a pastor, that's impossible. They will call you 10. They will call you 11. They will call you 12. Their problem is your problem. When they die, you too must die. Because if you don't die with them, they think you don't love them. So it's a very tough ministry. And so many of us find ourselves there. And we don't know what we get ourselves into. So that's what I want us to look at in this session. The challenges of being a pastor. Especially in the world of today. Hello? Now, why is it, why, 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 why is it so hard to be a pastor today? Why? I want to answer some questions. That's a question. Why is it so tough? 
And a lot of people that have found themselves there in charge of two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people, a hundred, a thousand, one thousand. Why? Why is the ministry so difficult? Let's answer some questions today so that you know what you get yourself into so that you can be prepared. And like the adage of the scout, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. So that when you are a pastor, you are pastoring people, oh, you know the challenges you are facing. And I want something else that's not there. I just saw a scripture and I want it for you, for you to know this is a tough ministry. And it's a 24-7 ministry. Okay, let's, let's go now. Being the pastoral ministry is often time a 24-7 job. Often times it's a 24-7 job. It is demanding, stressful, and thankless. I need you to note that. It is demanding, stressful, and what? Tankless. It's a tankless job. Because after you pass up people and pass up people and pass up people, if they prosper financially, materially, it will take God for them to remember you. If you are a true pastor, if you are not a mercenary, if you are not a hireling, if you really want to pastor after God's heart, it will take time for people to remember you. You know the work of a pastor? It's like a teacher in the primary school or the secondary school. You nurture them, you teach them ABC and everything, set them on the path of life. After they grow, they go to university and they graduate everything. They will only, if they ever remember you, it must be God at work. You see them, the children you taught, they are driving past and you are riding your own legacy bands. And they say, ah, Tisha. And they only remember you for the Koboko that you came then. It's a thankless job. It's a thankless job. Okay, before I go to those challenges, let's read one or two Bible passages also. Acts of Apostle, chapter 20. Acts of Apostle, chapter 20. Verse number 28. Among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. To shepherd the flock, take heed, overseers. Those are cogent words. First Peter chapter number 5. I'll be reading some couple of verses there. First Peter, chapter number 5. The elders from verse 1. Who are among you I exalt? I who am also a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you. Shepherd that flock of God which is among you. Serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonored gain, but eagerly, not as being laws over those entrusted to you, but by being examples to the flock. Okay, you see that my translation is different to your own. I've changed. All these years, I was married to King James Version. So now I am in New King James Version. You too should change. You know, I was so married. Even my old King James Version, some of the places I've tear off, I didn't re- I was still reading it. I was still using it. Until he wants to disgrace me. That's when I brought new one. So it's difficult to change. <laughs> Amen. Pastoral ministry. The scriptures have so much to say about it. Shepherd the flock of God. Not for filthy looker. Or has been laws over God's heritage. But the Bible says, has been examples to the flock. Now let's look at the challenges. Let's look at the challenges. In modern times, pastoral ministry is especially difficult because of the followings. Number one, too high expectation from the people. People of today expect you to be a superhuman being. I remember some people visited a pastor. His members, they visited a pastor. Uh, and the wife say, sorry, oh, pastor cannot come out because he's sick. They say, ah, sick? Pastor, 
sick? Do pastor get sick? The mom will say yes. Ah, you say, let him pray for me before he died. Even the last prayer in his own. In another occasion, some people visited the pastor and the wife asked them to stay in the living room because the pastor is having his, uh, he's taking his uh, dinner. And one of the elders say, Pastor, they chop. He eats. What an, what an insult. Pastor is eating. When we are here, tell him to come. Oh, they thought he's a superhuman being. Too high expectation. People don't expect pastors should make mistakes. People don't expect that pastors should be affected with the frailties that affect everybody. Number two, this is information and technology age. That's one of the challenges of pastoring today. The normal pastor today must have iPad, iPhone, IDs, ID. If you don't have it, you are still living in the 19th century. That is the age we are. The normal pastor today must know how to use computer. Have an email address and download information. Am I talking to somebody? For you to know that you are old. If your children are the ones that help you to set up your phone, you are in trouble. You are old. Though. If your children are the ones that are operating all this system in your house, if they go to school, you don't know how to open DSTV. Only problem, what is that? And I'm joking at you because that's what is happening to me. I have to learn it. You buy one phone. Before you know it, my little boy will say, bring it, bring it, daddy, bring it. Pe, 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 pe. He said, this is it. Oh. Money, eh? You bring something. You, don't, you are still looking for a way to operate it. They will take it. Turn it upside down. How did you do that? I say it's simple now. That is the age of today. Now, you know why I'm saying that? This is a technological age. Before, the pastor is the only one that has two, three, four, five Bible. Today, it's no more the case. Most phones in your hands have Bible there. Hello. <laughs> you know one pastor? He's an old pastor. So, uh, he called a Bible passage in the church. So people pick out their phones and they were trying to... They, he didn't know that they download Bibles to phones. So the pastor was saying, the Bible says, search the scriptures. It doesn't say phone the scriptures. <laughs> people were just laughing. And they said, yes, sir, Bible is here. Bible, let me read for you, sir. He said, no, search the scripture. It is paper. Search, search, search. It doesn't say phone the scriptures. That is the world we are. By the time you are quoting one verse, some people even have their, they have about four or five different Bible versions that they look at at the same time so they can see the meaning. They know either you are telling lie, either you are saying it the right way, the etymological word or not. That is the information age we have found ourselves in ministry. So you can't afford to be backward. Shallow and inadequate training. That's another challenge. There are lot, many of us in pastoral ministry. Our training is very shallow. And you know the teaching, the mindset, the culture that, that have been built in ministry in the last uh, 20 years is that you don't need a Bible school, you don't need to go to any school, just go to one month course, two weeks course, three week course, and you are pastoring. That's why we are finding it very tough. Because our training is very, very small and shallow today. Take my brother. Can you go to three weeks course and become a lawyer? Please answer me. Can you go to two weeks course and become a pilot? Can you, become, can you go to two weeks course and have some uh, courses here and there, some certificate uh, for five days conferences here and there, and you're already a doctor? You will have killed many people. But that's what we do in ministry. And you know, some of us will come up and say, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, somebody. Praise the Lord, somebody. My God is good. When He called me, He said, I should not land under anybody. <laughs> he will lead people astray. And you know, many of us in Bible that 
So we don't go to any training, no Bible school, no theology, no foundation, nothing. Conferences, we don't go. Training, never. How about improving yourself? No, we have the, I have the Holy Spirit. You will mislead many people. And that's why ministry is so challenging today. Because the people you, are, you want to pastor, they have more training than you. Disastrous personal problems. That's another reason why the ministry is so challenging today. There are many of us, our personal problems is destroying our ministry. I'm coming there. Consumer mentality among people. Yeah, people of today, they don't want the truth. They just want to be entertained. So pastors are, are tempted to bend corners and cut corners and keep the people entertained so that they keep coming back. Today, if you preach it truth, the hard truth, a lot of people will go. That's another challenge. Church members migration. Yeah. People move from church to church. Church to church. In those days, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you only know about maybe three, four, five churches. Anglican, Catholic, Methodist, Baptist. Bing. Okay, Protestant. Bing. After that one, no more church. But today, there are so many churches. Satan sharp sharp. Gospel church. Shukudi and sons. Nigerian uh, Christian Center. <laughs> Francis Holy Ghost, the Apostolic Church of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He's there. And everything. Scott Mizu Mizu Church. He's there. Operation Satan must die. Church of God. Elijah has come back. Gospel Center. And many churches. Many churches. Many churches. So if you discipline them here, they run here. If you preach the truth, if you say, no, 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 you've been practicing premarital sex, we can't marry you here. They say, you, you won't marry her, you will see, we'll get married. And they go to that church, the following Sunday, they are married. That's the challenge of pastoral ministry today. Money struggles, yes, that's another one, money struggles. There are a lot of pastors in ministry, they don't have the money. They don't have the money. There are a lot of challenges when it comes to finance today. Yeah. Jet age, iPad, iPod, computers, internet, that simplify things and turn the world to a global village. Okay, you can hear every animal shall say it. Before, if missionaries are coming to Nigeria, it will take them six months in the steamship to travel here. No, the world has grown. Look at Bishop Anderson from Canada. Just about 10 hours flight. He's here. To go to London now, just six hours. You can go in the night and come back tomorrow evening. That's what takes six months before. Three months before. So it's a jet age. It's a global village. And with CNN, with Sky News, with DSTV, and all those things today, what is happening on one side of the world, you can't hear it on another side of the world. That exact moment. Hello? All these things bring a lot of challenges. Bring the public confidence. Yes! The public, their confidence in pastors and leadership is going down. It's not their fault, but because of too many scandals, too many misdemeanors, too many evils happening. Hardly do, hardly do you open a newspaper in a day, especially that newspaper called The Sun. Hardly do you open it in a day and you don't read about a pastoral scandal. Hello? Yeah, it's happening. And many pastors today, there are a lot of there are a lot of professional herbalists who masquerade as pastors. I'll tell you one story. It happened recently. You'll be amazed, you'll be shocked, but believe you me, it's true. A past a father in the Lord. In fact, he called me this morning. We shouted this morning. He's in our school at Ibadan. He's lecturing there today. It's only those of us in Lagos that didn't go. Now we're shouting. Just about two weeks ago. And I was saying some things. Then he told me. It was me and Dr. Awishok. We were sitting with him. In fact, that morning, we were shocked. The shock did not leave me until the following day. I said, what? He said, I'm telling you the truth. Let me go and show you. This is what he told us. He said, a woman ran to his house and said, Baba, 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 save me, save me. That 
pastor in that church has collected my ear, armpit. I didn't mention you are the one saying ha. <laughs> and uh, he said, how did he collect it? He said he used razor blade. Ha! Ah! He said, yes, I just helped me collect it back. Okay, the man of God said, that father in the Lord said, he went to that pastor, come prophet, and said, Hey, there's a woman in my house now uh, saying you collected her hair up, uh, armpit and under. Uh, uh, he said, yes, Baba, yes. And you know the name of the church? Ground and Pillar of Truth Gospel Church. Uh, you've not heard anything, no? There are things I decide not to say. Because if I say, you will say it's a lie. Uh, before you talk, uh, if I say it now, you are the one that will turn back and say, he's just condemning everybody. So I will say the one that will benefit you. Now he said, okay. The my prophet said, Baba, can you describe the woman? And this, 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 what, 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 what. Then he said, ah, that is Afusa. Ah. You want to collect it back? He said, yes. He said, he went and brought a box. And labeled that box here, head here. And brought another box, armpit here. And brought another bo- box, public here. And when he opened, that man of God said to the Lord who live it, he saw more than 20 with the names of the owners attached to it. And he searched and said, This is Afusa. <coughs> <laughs> and such a thing. <laughs> this is Afusa. And Baba, that is for you. You can take it to her. And he said he was shocked. I said, I counted about 2020. He said, Yes. What are you using them for? He said, It's for prophetic purpose. Uh-uh. What do you mean? He said, Anytime I need any one of them to sleep with, I just do whatever I need to do and they will come. I don't need to follow, they will come. They are the one who brought it, and they are, they are using it for them. Say, eh? And he said, ah, Baba, this one you have collected. You just collect it, or I've used it, too. So tomorrow, if you see uh, uh, Afusa in his house, don't be offended, though. He said, he, just, he went, gave it to her. He said, but as the Lord lived, it, as he's talking to us, Afusa left her husband's house with five kids. And came and believing with that prophet. Today, she's raising the second baby for that man. How about that? Now imagine those women, 20 women. When the public hears that, and they publish it in the papers, or they publish some things, and whatever. Oh, you say, wow. It's affecting all of us. Either they are white garment, or black garment, or yellow garment, or, or, black, or, or free garment. It doesn't matter. The public doesn't know the difference. So today, one of the challenges we face is that, as a pastor, you have to prove that I am real, I am original, I am genuine. Nobody will believe you until you prove it. And that makes the ministry more tougher for us. Escalation of infidelities. Today we see a lot of pastors divorcing their wives. Divorcing their wives. Sleeping with their maids. I've even heard of pastors sleeping with their daughters. Yeah, not only church members. I remember we did a men's seminar. We did a men's seminar. It was here. We only invited men to come. We would call it men matters. Because there was these things we said to men that we don't want to say to everybody. You know when we finished, I remember that day I talked about how not to die young as a man. And I marched out some points. That one of the major reasons why a lot of men die faster and they don't wait to be the father of their children is because they molest the women in their lives. They take sexual advantage of the women in their life. Not my words, the women in their lives. Because in a man's life, there are many women. 
your wife, your mother, your sister, your niece, your daughter, your whatever, your maid, and as a pastor, your, your members. When you sexually take advantage of them, you sign your death warrant. Because any woman you have sex with have power over you. She only needs to say, except you don't climb this mountain. And you climb that mountain very well. So you know when we said that, the men were shocked. And we prayed. You know, I was sitting down there when we closed. One small jangala thing. One young man, he came to me. He said, sir, you are speaking to me. I said, you? I don't know you. I just said what the Lord said I should say. He said, it's me. Look at what he said. He said in his church, he's a pastor. In his church, every week, he must sleep with four women. I look at him again and say, you? Where did you get his friend? And he said, if I don't sleep with them, they will not be happy. Jesus, my God, I know why you you. Save us from this devil. I say you. He said, yes, sir. So when you were speaking, sir, I was shaking. I need you to pray for me. I said, prayer. We will pray another day. Those kind of women. Will they believe any pastor? When a pastor is preaching to them and it's one, one of them. It's one of them. That's what has made the ministry to be very, very tough today. Now let's look at reasons why pastors fall away in ministry. And you know, let me look at that statistics there. And make sure you are not going to be a statistic like that. 50% of ministers and pastors that start out in ministry we not last 10 years in ministry. That's based on the research. Too many pastors are falling by the wayside, spiritually and physically. Here are reasons we have discovered. Number one, discouragement. A lot of pastors are discouraged. And when they are discouraged, they fall away. They fall away. Because in your state of discouragement, uh-huh. When somebody comes around toasting you, motivating you, yes, you preach well and you are very good, and all those things, you are emotionally attached to that person. And if it's the opposite said, before you know what happened, what has crossed bridge? Two, failure. 70% of pastors say they have low self image now that when they started the ministry, they compare themselves with others and feel they are failed. Pastors don't have real genuine. And close friends. And that's the truth. A lot of pastors, when they, they compare themselves with our big, big bishops, with our secular people, people in the banking sector, in the insurance, in the oil sector, you measure yourself, your physical life, your standard of living with them, and you conclude, me, I started the ministry seven years ago, ten years ago, I have only about hundred members. What kind of ministry is that? Look at my house, look at my clothing, look at my this, look at my that. And you conclude that you are a failure. And you get out of the ministry. I know a lot of pastors that have returned back to carpentry. They have returned back to business. They pack up the ministry because of discouragement. Number three, moral lapses. Moral lapses. A lot of pastors have fallen by the wayside because of sexual sins. More than 40% of pastors say they have problems here. And let me say this to you. Look up at me. There are a lot of emotionally needy people in church today. And many of them are our members. Okay, one day I was doing this lecture in class. I was telling my students. Okay, I was even doing this lecture called Wholesome Sexuality. Because in our school, and I hope you will come, we will resume the last Monday of this month. I teach about these issues. I said in every church, every church that is 100 member church, you have four kinds of people. Emotionally talking, okay, sexually speaking, you have the predators, people that eat sex like food, people that are pornography minded, they come to church, and when you dress anyhow, you talk anyhow, they are thinking sexual thoughts towards you, because they are predators. Number two, 
People that have been raped, abused, they come to church. Number three. Now let me give you the name. Uh, people that have low sexual drive. They marry over, but they don't sleep with their wives. It's a big problem. They can't perform, but they don't have interest. They are there in church. Hello? And you know what? What you don't preach against will overcome you in church. What you keep silent about, thinking that they can't be doing that because we are properly clothed and we dress very well. And brother, sister, we are going to heaven. We thank God, sir. The grace of God. The Holy Spirit. Those are language. Oh. Behind that language. Under that cloth. Why are they? Oh? So when you don't preach it, when you don't give people way out, it's going to overwhelm you. In church, we have a lot of single mothers, single fathers today. One of people who are not married, or people who are married, for living alone. Don't you think? How did they set you their sexual issue? Because, my brother, this flesh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And you don't preach to that area, you don't talk about that area. Then the thing is that there will be a lot of immorality in the church. And that's why you have been seeing a lot of lapses today. And one more thing in that angle before I leave there. You know, was it last year conference? I said something about men in the church. That the church of today is an abnormal church. Why is it abnormal? That it's not a New Testament church because there are much more women in church today than in scripture. In scripture, there are more men in church than women. But today, there are more women in church than men. And you know, I gave a definition. I gave a definition that the church of today is a woman's club with a few male officers. Some of you still remember. And you know, I wrote that two book by then. The man in, in the church. And uh, Frank talked to men. Now, this is, my, this is what I discover. When the church of today is a woman's club with a few male officers, and you know, without apologies to our sisters and mothers, wonderful women of God, apologies to them, but this is the reality. Now, when, you know, women are taking over most of the duties of the church today, they are the one in the choir. Women are now playing organ. They play band set. Isn't it? They are the treasurer. If women take care of your money, they will not steal it. Except the one that is demonized. <laughs> and women are taking over many things in the church. And during the week, midweek services, you don't see the men. It's women are fear. That's why in church today, women ministry, women prayer, women Bible club, women this, women that. It's so prevalent. Now, according to the book of Elders, chapter 14, verse 45. And when a pastor has a lot of women surrounding what is expected? That's the problem. So that's why there are a lot of moral lapses today. No accountability. A lot of pastors live in isolation. They are not accountable to anybody, to God or to man. No, no mentor, no father, no leader. Look, let me say this. I know this issue of mentorship, this issue of fatherhood, have been abused and bastardized. But that is not to take away from the fact that we still need real fathers. And each of us need real mentors. Each of us need people to oversee our life. If you are all in all, you are going to be in problem. Because the only Alpha and Omega is God. If you try to be another one, you fall into trouble. And when you are a pastor, you have no pastor pastoring you. You have nobody you are accountable to. You have nobody that you say, Sir, you call me anytime, Sir, smack me. Yes, I come to report myself. Or you tell your wife or your spouse that, Look, if I'm misbehaving, if you notice something, you talk to me and I don't listen. You know who to report me to. When you have no people like that over your life, I can assure you, I can assure you, you're on your way to something else. 
Because I've seen a lot of young people. And hey, this is your fatherhood. I don't believe in it. Well, either you believe it or in it or not, it doesn't take away from the fact that we need it. When you nobody is betting your doctrine, when nobody can call you in private, that that thing you teach. So, tell me, show me in the Bible. And you say, yes, sir. Uh, it just came. Don't let that devil come back. When well, you have nobody like that over your life, my brother, you are swimming in a in a fish in a shark invested ocean. Financial pressure has turned a lot of pastors to thieves and robbers today. Emotional adverse. A lot of pastors get angry. They get angry. They spleen their anger and their frustrations on their people today. Aspire prayer life. Yes, of course, a lot of pastors are not praying. In fact, research about pastors say 45% of pastors say they don't pray more than 19 minutes a day. And when your when ministry has taken over your ministration to the Lord, you will fall away. You will not fall in Jesus' name. Physical health, yes. 75% of pastors report significant stress-related crisis at least once in their ministry. Many pastors overwork themselves and do not care for their bodies. When you are busy, it's easy to eat poorly. And many are experiencing exhaustion. Look up at me. Let me say something there. Can you see me? How many of you know me? Seven, eight years ago. You know I am two times than this. And my stomach was nine months pregnant. But you can see me. I've been taking care of my head. Because I almost died. This work is a killing job. And number one killer, stress. You know the star says, when you preach one hour, you have done eight hours job. It's equivalent to a full day's job. And most of you, you are so busy preaching four or five times a week, you even do VG. There's a friend of mine now, God will heal him in Jesus' name. He's a good friend of mine. Very good pastor. Genuine man of God. But you know what? He can't walk again. It's not a taco. And he's just about 52 years old. In the last one year, since last year, February, he couldn't raise his leg again. I didn't even know. He just called me. That, uh, can you believe that I can't walk? I say, you? He said, yes. You? Then we arranged. When I saw him, I took a physiotherapist to him. I said, check, the, check him up. That one told me that from his head to his toe, there is stress. It was that accumulated stress that affected his veins. And blood is no more circulating. In fact, when I touch his toe, my hand sank in. I said, bro, that is stress. And he has gone to hospitals. He has spent more than one million. I said, no, you just need exercise and you need massaging. Like when we finished here yesterday, I went for massaging. That's why I'm still alive today. And I'll go massaging every day. I'll go massaging. And I'll pay just a thousand naira. And I exercise. Today, I got bicycle in my house. I ride bicycle with my children. And then, pardon me, my fella ain't you hello. Those of you that are quoting scripture, eh, bodily exercise, profited little. That little is very much. The killer of pastors, stress. It starts from here. When you have a stroke, it's not devil, it is stress. Thank God, one of our seminars tomorrow is a pastor also. And he will tell you things that you say, hey, divorce daily, withdraw weekly, abandon annually. If you can't follow that, then that's your problem. A lot of pastors fall away because of stress. And you know when you are stressed up, you are tired, you are frustrated, your mind, your mind and your brain is no more working at 100%. And you do some stupid and foolish things that you live to regret. Marriage and family problem. That's another one that is making pastors to fall away. And you know most of the time, 
We put ministry first. Our marriage second. Our family third. No, we should change the order. Most pastors, they don't nurture their family. They don't nurture their wife. They don't nurture their children. They have no time to play with their children. My brother, it is a quick step to falling away. Dry resources. Yes, you lack resources. You are dried up. Your training is shallow. Then, digression. How can we make positive impact as pastors? Difference. Number one, possess a clear vision from God. If your vision is gold, go and renew it. Go and renew it. Without vision, the people perish. That's Proverbs 29, 18. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. We are coming there. Maybe tomorrow or Thursday. Come and talk about the Holy Spirit afresh in our lives. Then be devoted to dedicate and dedicate to holy living. My brother, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Hebrew 12, 14. Then build a dynamic prayer life. Pray personally. Go to a mountain to pray. Have prayer retreat. Have days of fasting and prayer. Wake up your prayer life. You can't be prayerless and succeed in this ministry. It's impossible. Number five, plan and work your personal growth. Ministerial and ministry growth. Plan for it. Plan for it. Those who are in my mentoring, they know I talk so much about planning your growth, your professional growth, your ministerial growth. Plan it. Because the more you grow, the more your ministry will grow. If you are no more growing, your ministry has stopped growing. I'm sorry. Some of you work in denominations. Well, when they hear this kind of conference, they'll go and put a program there so that you will not come. They are, it, there, it's there. They can do it. They can build that culture. But don't let it affect you. Because at the end of the day, you are responsible for your life. You are responsible. If you make a mess of it, it's your cup of tea. And if you grow, it's your cup of tea. So plan your growth. Plan the schools you will go. Plan the books you will read. Plan the seminars you will attend. Plan the trainings you will go. Work your plan. Plan your work and work your plan. That's all will help you to keep growing. You know, when you're a pastor, you, your ministry is in your mouth. You must be saying new things, fresh things, every time people come. When people come and they sit down, they listen to you. They don't want to hear your old message. If they want to hear your old message in a new way, with new information. How do you get that? You must go for resources. You must go for training. You must equip yourself. You can't just afford to remain the same. And like I said earlier, it's a technological world. Your people are growing. Your audiences are growing. They are going here and there. They are learning. They are taking courses. They are all doing that. You can't afford to stand the same. Hello? Choose a godly mentor to be accountable to. Prayerfully choose a mentor. You need one, my brother. My sister, you need a mentor. Prayerfully choose one. And build a relationship. Not a mentor you only give offering to. And you forget it there. No, that's not mentorship. That is being taken advantage of. That is being foolish. If, you, if I say you are my mentor, I must have access to you. And I can tell you my stories. I can tell you my struggles. Of course, I will give you that. But it's a willing thing. It's not by force. Hello? Are you still around? Be accountable. Don't be all in law. Don't be alpha and omega. Number seven. Raise intercessors that will lift you up. You need prayer back up. No matter how anointed you are, you need to be prayed for. Believe the, 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 the pleading and the exhortation and the, and the challenge and the, and the, and the what Paul normally say, brethren, pray for us. You need prayers. You need prayers. Leaders can never survive without the prayers of their people. Balance your ministry and your healthy lifestyle. Balance it. Balance it. Healthy eating and exercise is great stress reliever. Look at what is there and underline it. Avoid the three white killers. Salt, sugar, and flour. Flour. Avoid them. You know most of what we eat, they are white, 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 white. Do away with some of these whitish things. Sugar, what salt, flour, uh, all these things. These white substances. Reduce them. Reduce them to be honest minimum. Don't eat them five times a day or eat them five days a week. <laughs> Mix it. Mix it. And you know what? What I normally say, let me keep saying them back now. Once you are 40 years old, you are no more a baby. 
your body begins to wear and tear. You need to repair it. You need to know, ah, I believe in divine healing. Yes! But there's a if to divine healing. If thou shalt obey the Lord your God and eat balanced diet, then thou shalt live in good health. Invest in others and build a solid team. Do the things only you can do and delegate the rest. And delegate the rest. Some people cannot be here this week because have a program. Delegate it, my brother. Have time to, to go and refresh your life and your soul. Even if we are telling you what you have known before, at least we are saying it in a new way. If you don't get anything, at least you are laughing. Auto now. You're not auto. How much did you pay? 2005. Huh? It has expired since yesterday. Hey, talk with I know alone. Number 10. Take time to refresh, to recoup, and to revitalize. Rest one day in seven. Withdraw weekly. And abandon what to annually. I hope you know what that means. Have a day you rest during the week. Have time to go to leave annually and go on leave. Go on vacation. And somebody say, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If I go on vacation, the sinners will perish for your information. They have been perishing before you were born. <laughs>